Hello everyone and welcome to Into the Cypher State, the premier public broadcast of Galactica Network. This week we're going to be chatting with an incredible lineup of guests uh, and the most pressing matters affecting the Web3 space right now. So make sure you stick around. Uh, we will be opening up the floor to, uh, to listeners and um, citizen speakers uh, for your opinions and hot takes on the topics we're going to be discussing. Uh, my handle is Citizen42 um, within the Cypher State, uh, but you can call me Dave. Today I'm joined by my regular co-host Cosmos Hoss and my very special guest, Keystone Wallet. Um, so let's just introduce everyone, just go around very quickly, and then we'll get on with the show. Uh, let's, start with, uh, let's start with my co-host, Hoss. Just give, us, give everyone a wave, man. Hi, everyone. Just seeing how everyone's doing. As always, I'm here, and I'm excited to kind of just talk about crypto and current events and see what's going on. There's been a lot of moving parts, mainly in, in um, the EU. It looks like they're trying to kind of set the precedent and be the leader in this space when it comes to actually having some guidelines and rules that those can follow, unlike, you know, here in the States. So kind of going to go over some topics today and um, looking forward to the conversation. And I'm, I'm also excited to have a special guest, Keystone. I was saying it earlier on the, the rug space for those out there. I'm an avid Keystone user. It's really cool. It's way better than Key, uh, than Ledger. It's just a better experience. And, you know, I'm not trying to get you to buy it or anything, but if you are tired of like, a, you know, Ledger's and you want potentially a better alternative, you know, definitely give Keystone a look because I, I personally have had a way better time in crypto using their wallet over Ledger. It was, all, it was always an issue with my Ledger wallets, and I have three of them, dude, and dude, they're dude. all, yeah. none of them ever held a charge. Pulse. I get it. Just, okay, you're a shill. I understand. But... I understand. It's okay. You're a shill. I got it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, Keystone, man. With I mean, Carlos has already introduced you. Just, just give yourself an introduction, man. Uh, yeah. Hi guys, my name is Gareth. I'm from the Keystone Hardware Wallet. Nice to see you guys. What a lovely afternoon. Yeah, I think that's all. <laughs> the Cosmos Hall actually you introduced us already. <laughs> that's okay, man. You got a fan up here. That's cool. Um, okay, um, and from our side, we uh, we have myself, Dave. Uh, I'm a content manager, and we also have A Star Gala, who is our technical lead. Um, yeah, A Star, could you just introduce yourself? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Frederick. I'm uh, part of the Galactica development team. So I'm come a bit from the technical side, studied computer science, I'm working now in crypto for a couple of years, and uh, really excited um, to join the space. Especially also because I love hardware wallets. And, um, uh, I hope to, to learn something new there about Keystone. No, we're super thankful to have you up, man. Really are. Okay, guys. Um, so I'm just going to dive right into it because we lost a little time with uh, with the technical issues. Um, so today we're going to going to begin with the latest news um, from um, from the EU, as uh, as Pulse has said. Um, so what's happened today? Well, not today, but we've had the um, the markets and crypto assets law has um, been um, accepted by the EU by the EU uh, Parliament. Uh, that's been um, confirmed now, which is good in a lot of ways it's um got everyone um uh, everyone's like uh pretty much seeing that the eu is leading the space in regular in regulatory terms as uh, as also said um there are a few uh, interesting points especially around stable coins um so um basically uh the eu is going to have the ability to veto um certain large cap stable coins do they basically cite the reasons being um, that it could be uh, it could destabilize the current financial system. Um, so, what do you guys think on, on like just general regulation? Like, uh, it doesn't have to be on Mica, but perhaps uh, implementations in the US and anywhere else. Um, do you think that um, stable coins can, in any way, destabilize the current financial rails of uh, any given country? Uh, I'm going to pass this over to Hoss just for a quick take, and then we'll uh, we'll just see who else wants to answer. I mean, yeah, I mean, the, if, if it's actually collateralized, I don't see what the problem is because right now, you know, throughout, I know throughout America, I'm, I'm sure it's probably in other parts of the world too, that it's really not backed by anything besides kind of like faith, you know, like the United States dollar for the most part is just backed by the military and nothing really else, you know, and just kind of, it's just like good faith token, you know, you, you go to the bank and you want to take out the money from the bank 
they, they make it very impossible to do so. Even if you want to go deposit a large sum of actual cash, like they, they, you know, they don't want to do it. So it's kind of, you know, kind of sketchy when you think, when you think about it that way. And then you look at stable coins, right? Like USDC, for example, I don't even know the market cap, but it's very large and it's actually collateralized. Like circle has the funds for it. So, you know, what's more secure in my opinion, something that's actually there or something that's just kind of fictitious. So my opinion, yes, it could, but will they allow it? Probably not because they, they can't control it. It's, it's not their, it's not their uh, keys, you know, it's not their baby, so to speak. So they probably won't want bigger stable coins because they don't have complete autonomy, like control of it. So it's hard, it's hard to say, you know, me personally, yes, I'm all for the stable coins and I'm for multiple stable coins, you know, diversify stable coins backed by different things. Like there's a quite a few different stable coins out there that are kind of fascinating like i i like the ones that are backed by you know different things like whether it's just like a global back basket of assets or bitcoin or a combination of bitcoin gold or whatever it may be you know as long as it's there and it's actually collateralized why not yeah that's fair enough i mean basically under the new rules um firms are who are wishing to issue stable coins or tokenized assets basically have to obtain a license from the 27 EU member block. Um, so it's quite a, it's quite a, a burden for most firms to actually actually get hold of this license, I imagine. Um, Keystone, do you have an opinion on this one? It's just uh, just a quick take. Uh, actually, no. Actually, not. I, 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 I agree with the Cosmos host, but uh, maybe I could, you know, there are some... There are one things I know that may be relevant to this one. I, I live in Singapore, so there are you know a bunch of you know another Asia country yeah, n- nearby. There are uh, lots of people use. I, I'm not sure. Did you guys know like a, a a crypto depository card, like you depository USDT or USDC into this card? Is it, it is a virtual or Visa or Mastercard, and you can spend you know the card online or, or offline. Yeah, they they are very popular in in Southeast Asia because they, as some of people that don't have you know exercise to some uh, some big bank to get a, a Visa or, or Mastercard. Yeah, but but some of this card, the, the KYC and the regulation is pretty. Uh, I'm not sure to say it's bad, but it's not not tech. So <laughs> I know some you know the the drug. Uh, the drug dealer in Thailand that use that kind of car to, you know, to, to, to make some exchange for their business. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I guess that's like complete freedom of, uh, complete freedom of finances just at the, uh, at the negative of, you know, possible malicious use. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I think it's pretty interesting because I know there, you know, I'm not sure this kind of card has, you know, has market share in, in United States or, or European Union, but but in, in you know in some third classes country like like, like Thailand or something else. Yeah, they're, they're, yeah, no, that's completely understandable, man. To be honest, I say um the like I said, this uh, the the market bill and like uh, the the regulations coming in in general around the world is it's very important to the entire space. It's just that, you know, in some place, like, as, as we've kind of discussed already, the, the EU is basically the only place that's actually got anything on paper yet. Um, so it's not really, I guess, uh, relevant to some to some jurisdictions and regions. So I completely understand why you don't have uh, much of a take on that one, to be honest. It's completely fair. Um, in fact, I think while we actually have you, Keystone, I'd actually like to just bring up um, the, the main topic that I would like to discuss today, which is in the title of the space, um, and that is Ledger Recover. Um, so if you don't mind guys, uh, if you, if you're okay with that, I'd like to just switch over to the main topic because uh, it seems to make a lot more sense. Um, so yeah, yeah, sure. yeah? cool. Um, so, um, we'll just, uh, go with that latest news from Ledger everyone. Um, so just for the context for people in the audience, for those unaware, um, Ledger is a French company. Uh, it designs and builds pretty much the most well-known hardware wallets, I would say, in the space. Um, there might be some argument there, I'm not sure, but I would say they're probably the most well-known. Um, so in the last six hours or so, um, they released a new feature called Ledger Recover. Um, it's an opt-in seed phrase recovery service. Um, so what I'd like to do is I'm just going to read you basically the hook of their promotional material for you. 
Um, and then we'll open the floor to you guys to just give your takes and answers. Um, so uh, their hook is as follows. Um, it's a backup solution for your seed recovery phrase so you can recover your wallet anytime, anywhere, without your secret recovery phrase. Your recovery phrase is duplicated, encrypted, and linked to your identity, then split into three fragments. Each fragment is secured by three separate private companies, and then their key phrase is, your identity is the key to your wallet. So, damn, I actually kind of feel like uh, the mouthpiece of some dystopian government saying that. Um, so, normally, uh, I would let my co-host Cosmos Hoss take his face, uh, have his take first. Uh, but as we have you, Keystone, I would love to have your take first on this and what you kind of think about the current uh, goings on. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, Keystone, you there? Yeah, I mean, they're best stuck in there. Yeah, I saw this feature. Yeah, I saw this feature too, but I'm not sure that what is the detail, you know, about this, you know, you said uh, the three different part, party on the cryptographic, you know, in the different place and different company. Yeah, they later talk, tweet this on this on this tweet, but actually, we, we, I think, and I, and I think another one also think that we need more, you know, disclosure about this, this feature. And, and and the ledger hardware wallet actually hardware itself is not uh, it's, it's not an open source wallet. So I mean, uh, ledger is all competitor. So I mean, maybe I said that is uh, okay. Maybe uh, I should maybe I should put this in a different way then, man. Um, so uh, yeah. um, we have um, ledger who is putting who is basically um, sending out. Um, previously, one of their one of their main sell points has been that they will never ever have your seed phrase leave your hardware wallet and now obviously this feature completely <laughs> removes that tagline i guess because they are sending it to three well they are sending it in an encrypted form in uh three shards to three separate private companies um but that still the in um in some people's eyes would suggest that there is um some kind of encoded pathway for the um for these phrases to be um, obtained maliciously. Um, so what's your stance as, um, as a wallet provider, uh, a hardware wallet provider? Um, would you ever want to provide such a recovery service? Um, yeah, definitely no. Actually, it's a pretty complicated, you know, the, the service. I think the laser have enough, you know, the engineer to do that, but maybe, I think this is the wrong way. Actually, yeah, I just noted that. No, notice that on Twitter, if you use later recover, you later generate a, a additional backup phase. So that that mean that that they are they could access as your secret recover phase. Not otherwise, they can generate an additional backup phase. It's, yeah, I think they need to explain more about about this feature. Yeah, yeah back to the track. Yeah, the, the Keystone won't do do that. You know, kind of the feature in the. In the future, like a recover or something else, actually, it's the, the most uh, focus is security. I, I know each of the hardware wallets say that they're focused on security, but it's on, yeah, they put that up more on the first. Actually, the customers talk about that the Kiston use a QR code as the, the main interactive way, way to you know to send your your token and receive your token. Uh, actually. Some of people think that the QR code is not yeah. a, a little bit weird. Yeah, and maybe it's not that actually the QR code is safe. Yeah, I there are some. I'm, I'm not sure if guys you heard about that. They're con con that. Uh, gap. Let me check. There, there are something called the light gap. I'm not sure that how to say that in English. It's a it's kind of you know a security gap like an air gap or something else that can used in some, you know, in government facility to tr exchange the information between uh, the the internal network and outside the internal work. Yeah, something like that. And Keystone has a, you know, self destructure de design like a, yeah, I, I think it's more, yeah, more, uh, how to say that, more capable than the later one. Yeah. And one more thing is that uh, I'm not sure the Cosmo host mentioned earlier that the the later uh, the, the Keystone wallet don't have or own 
software wallet. I know their the ledger has the ledger layer, and you know the treasure has their own software wallet. And yeah, but but Keystone don't have. We just have a a companion app on App Store or Google Play, but actually it's not a a software wallet. Uh, I, it's not a software wallet. It's just a watch only wallet. So, I another you know design or, or purpose is that you can you can use MetaMask for EVM chain you know and and connect it to your Keystone wallet or your your use Kepler wallet on, on Cosmos chain and you know each chain we want to you know bring the bring you to connect the different software wallet if you like some. The software wallet that you can use that with your Keystone wallet. You, you do not need to stick to to you know like if you use Ledger, you you definitely need to use the Ledger Live. And this Ledger Live sometimes has some technical issues, and I'm not sure guy you guys has encountered before. And yeah, I encountered several times that you know, it, one time I you know, traveled to Hong Kong that I can uh, connect to their network, and, and I, I don't know why, but. Yeah, you need some setup proxy to to connect to 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 the to the nature dot com. So, not otherwise, I can't see my assets through the nature line. I don't like this. Uh, so, so that's would it would it be fair that. to say that maybe um, Keystone uh, Keystone as a wallet is more as more simplistic, but a bit more bulletproof of a system? I would say. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank, yeah, thank you for summarize that. I mean. No, that's cool, man. That's cool. No, it's uh, it's it's uh, it's really interesting. Like uh, I've taken a look at your uh, your stuff, and it does look really uh, really interesting. Like a really good UX, and like I say, I, I like I like the idea of simplicity when it comes to security. Um, what I'd like to do um, right now, I think, um, because we started a bit late, I think I'd like to bring up some public speakers. We've already got Norek Eth on the stage, um, who's raising his hand. So I'd love to get your take in a second, mate. Um, so if anyone else would like to just uh, raise their hands and would like to just contribute in a bit more of a public forum kind of style, I'd be more than happy with that right now. Um, again, I'm sorry for the late starting space uh, that was unavoidable. So if you just like to like, raise your hands and if you could all drop down into the comments as well of this space, give us a like, give us a retweet, um, see if we can get more people into the space right now. That'd be awesome. Uh, I'd really appreciate that. Um, so Norek, if you could just, uh, if you'd like, welcome up to the stage, mate, and if you want to give your take, please do. Hello everyone, thank you for the uh, invite. So um, my take on the Ledger, the latest firmware update is, uh, first, uh, you read their tweet or their thread. There is one part of the thread that was deleted later on by Ledger team, which stated that uh, in the beginning they said that their secure element will encrypt and split the C trace in, uh, on chip through three fragments. And these will be sent to three different parties, uh, cryptographically hardware modules. Uh, this this is still the thing that is posted there, but the deleted part is that Ledger will also create a backup recovery phrase, which is not the seed phrase, and send them to three companies. And on the recovery, two of the three charts uh, will be sent from these companies to your new ledger secure element. So it should retrieve uh, the seed phrase from modules and decrypt it on the chip. So I'm not sure this part, why was it deleted? Uh, I'm not sure if it's uh, something that they revised or posted it by mistake. But my main issue is uh, the, sec uh, the security vectors uh, or the attack vectors that this might introduce uh, later on if you, we are using the opt-in uh, for this firmware update. So um, I actually own a ledger. So I own the X, the S, and even Trezor. Uh, I like the ledger more. So it's not FUD, uh, nor my thread about the ledger was a FUD. Thing is, if um, the thing that is off with this uh, service is it's against uh, what, according to them, six million users are using the hardware wallet from Ledger. That not your keys, not your crypto, and that they will never share your keys in any way. Yes, it's true they are not sharing your seed phrase in a public way, but it's still shared. 
uh, in an encrypted charted way. So this is the first thing. The second one is in the case of recovery, they are going to use a KYC with an ID or passport, whether uh, from EU, uh, Canada, USA, or UK. Um, the problem here is the KYC is not that secure. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys checked out uh, Zach, um, Zach XBT. When he did a KYC w with some exchanges with the fake IDs and he got approved just as what druggers or scammers try to do to get out the funds in a discreet way. So the thing is, Ledger on their spaces, distant uh, distanced themselves from the KYC part, which is the integral part of the recovery process. If if this KYC uh, thing um, gets compromised, whether a hack of the ID, a deep fake, or even uh, an AI generated ID, uh, anyone can just recover it uh, on a different device. It's a long shot. It's a hard way but it's still a security vector or a, uh, or even someone can just use social engineering to get into the three companies uh, in a way that they cannot use the KYC to recover. So that's my two takes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Norak. Yeah, I, I honestly, uh, I don't disagree with any of it. Um, I, it seems just uh, from my uh, non-technical uh, point of view that like, um, Ledger has kind of taken the most secure possible method of holding your crypto and they've um, reduced down um, like security down to three centralized entities um, and uh, opened up several security vectors and it's just not it just doesn't seem like a great look for a hardware wallet company um, so uh, like we for as, um, as Galactica Network for anyone who doesn't um, already know um, we are a, a layer one chain, and um, which deals a lot with uh, with privacy, self sovereignty, identity, um, and uh, zk proofs. And so, we, you know, we are going to be storing um, zk proofs in uh, in your uh, wallet, wherever that may be. Um, and you know, if we don't particularly uh, have, uh, we we have a massive, uh, obviously, stake in security. Um, but obviously these are these are ZKs and we actually have our technical lead uh, ASTAR.GALA with us so I'm sure he could actually probably explain more um, but yeah it's a, it's, a, it's a bit of a dangerous thing for a hardware wallet company um, saying that uh, Frederick do you want to have a word you got your hand up yeah uh, thanks um, I uh, totally agree with what you said uh, Nora. Um, and, and I also see um, there are some security vector issues that this has um, one is the KYC you mentioned and the social engineering. Um, I'm also wondering why is it just three? Couldn't it also be, I don't know, 10 or so um, shards where you can um, then assemble it uh, with a different number of shards? I don't know. Um, but uh, in general, I think the Ledger Recovery Service has, I think, two sides. Um, one is a good one and a bad one. And I think the good one is that they um, take the usability issues seriously. I think that is good because probably too many people have lost their keys, especially if they um, were a bit desperate in, in the uh, last bear run. And um, yeah, solving this usability issue is probably an important step to making crypto usable for a wide range of people. So I guess we nerds here in the core, we can usually manage our own keys, but if I um, the, the, the thing about my uh, parents um, using crypto, they will probably not uh, handle it so securely. So in, in this way, I think it's a, uh, a good one that they think about the usability and how it can be um, yeah, made available to more users. But on the other side, I think it's a bit bad that it's these private companies, so few, and also a bit against what I think is um, quite essential to crypto is this uh, self-custody um, aspect of it. And in, in my opinion, it would be a much better direction to what, for example, uh, Vitalik is uh, proposing, that you can have something like a social recovery, where you can have um, a wallet 
that can be recovered by um, um, a number of people you choose uh, your own. Maybe you choose, I don't know, um, 20 people from your family and friends. And then if you really need the recovery, you need to get um, 15 shards from them together or something like this. And in my opinion, this would be a better decentralized and um, yeah, also a way which is a bit more aligned with uh, what self-custody is going to be. And yeah, w w what it means for Galactica, I think uh, as a blockchain where um, people can also use a hardware wallet to sign transactions, and because we are also using uh, MetaMask there, and so every wallet that has a ledger recovery service is uh, also being able to use uh, Galactica. I think that um, we as a blockchain, of course, inherit um, all the properties of the wallets that are used for it. Um, yeah. So we de 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 depend on the wallet providers there. Yeah, absolutely, man. And thanks for that. Um, those, so, like, um, the... Um, Honest to God, we, we actually need to make sure that like uh, the, the hardware wallets that we're using, um, it, they need to um, hold themselves to a very high account when it comes to security. That's their primary primary purpose. Um, so we really need to absolutely make sure that they uh, they, they hold themselves to their own ideals. Um, Hoss, uh, you had your hand up earlier. I don't know if you'd had, still had a take. Yeah, so I mean, I know a couple teams in this space that are specifically making blockchains and applications for recovery methods that are going to probably be way more secure and technically sound than what, you know, I would assume a hardware wallet would, would do anyhow. And, you know, I, I just prefer personally, if you have a wallet, right, like I don't want any way from from for that device to be able to to uh, obtain that if i were going to going to do something like this i would much rather have this information on a decentralized you know layer 1 where no one can get access to it unless you know like there's parameters like the one that company i don't want to say who they are but they're working on something where it's like it's like for inheritance and things like that where you can opt in, say, right, okay, after, say, 90 days or a, a year of being inactive, you know, my wallet that I put the seed in, this is what the transaction is going to have. I'm going to send all my funds to this other wallet. And, like, you could do different different things that would be way more secure in this space than probably what this cent three centralized entities is. Like, I would never want to do something like that, right? Like, my, I have the Keystone wallet. I would never want my my seed phrase to be held anywhere with some central entity ever under no no circumstance. I would rather just lose my money and never have you know that as a as a, as a possibility. However, I do I do agree and do believe that the future of crypto, when it comes to wallets, is going to be solutions that you can still restore your your key, so to speak, because. I, you know, I do IT for some things and a lot of it's mainly just like web two and, and people are just, they're terrible on the computers. Like, let's face it. Most people that are, aren't in this space are a lot older and they're just not really good at the computer. They don't even remember how to put their password in they'll, they'll you know, like there's just so many things that they don't know about the computer. So if they were going to enter this space, they definitely would want some sort of way to retain their information because most likely they're going to lose their seed phrase or they're going to lose this or that and they need to have some way of restoring you know their funds so to speak so there will be solutions but i do believe that blockchain is a better solution than you know storing it in three different separate places and all this other stuff so i'm not opposed 100 percent against it because there, i just do think that there needs to be better solutions and i think there will be but i personally would rather it be on a blockchain I couldn't agree more, to be honest, man. Um, right, I'm just going to give everyone a bit of a reminder, guys, because we've got a few more listeners in now. Uh, if you could, uh, guys could just jump down, show some love in the comments, um, give us a like, give us a retweet. It would really help us. We had some technical issues when we started this space. Um, completely my fault. Had to fix it. Um, so if we could get the space out to more people and educate some more people, that'd be great. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's basically, um, Jay, kind of what um, Hoss was saying before. Sorry, Hoss, what? Uh, Frederick was saying before 
um, is um, these like decentralized social recovery methods. Um, they kind of would be the um, the uh, the way of solving this kind of thing. It's something we've been looking at with the Galactica Network um, extensively, um, and how to implement that in a fair way. Um, so. For again, for, for anyone not aware, um, we are an L1 uh, blockchain that's focused on uh, privacy, reputation, um, and uh, and various other and um, decentralized society with a bit more of a high ideal. Um, so we are looking at this kind of thing where you can um, you have a have private um, selective disclosures of your data to other entities on the network, and using that kind of that kind of thing as a as a framework as a basis. Um, it allows us to think about this kind of thing of um, like these decentralized social recovery methods. Um, and I think that's going to be a, a good way of going about things um, if uh, we can implement it in a way that um, makes sense and is secure. Um, so that's, uh, um, yeah, it's just, just a good way of doing things. Um, but um, there, are, there is obviously, um, for there, I've seen a lot of people saying that um, it's not really possible to um, for these uh, seed phrases to be hacked. Um, I would say... In, in response to that, um, look at LastPass. You know, uh, we, we've all seen the LastPass hack. Um, these guys, uh, they they tell themselves it's completely bulletproof. Uh, they got hacked. Everything got sent out. It's uh, you, you know, if uh, if you deal with centralized entities, um, there is always an attack vector there. Um, so yeah, um, I'd just like to remind everyone if you would like to come up and speak, we're actually doing this one a bit differently today because we started late. If you would like to um, just uh, if you'd like to raise your hand and request to speak, please do. We welcome all takes right now. Um, we're talking about ledger recovery and privacy, um, so um, it's a really interesting topic and it goes to the root of privacy in our space. So uh, yeah, we'd appreciate any take you might have. Um, yeah, um, so uh, Keystone, uh, obviously we have a Keystone Wallet here uh, today who is a, a manufacturer, a designer and manufacturer of, uh, of a hardware wallet. Um, it deals in multi-chain, I believe, Keystone, right? Just uh, pretty much any chain you can think of. Oh, yeah. This, I think the, uh, most of the, you know, uh, I don't know. Most of the chain, I can I can see that we support uh, all EVM chain. If you use, you know, if you connect your Keystone wallet to MetaMask, uh, yeah, yeah. And in another word, if that uh, EVM chain is supported by MetaMask or, or Core Wallet, you can, you know, you, you can use it with the uh, with Keystone wallet, and we we support Solana, uh, Tron, Near, and Cosmos, and uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, of course, the BTC. Yeah. Yeah, I got you, man. That's cool. Um, so, um, um, Gareth behind the account oh, here is and, 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 and Aptos. I'm not sure that, you know. You, and Aptos. Some, some, nice. some are just, yeah. yeah, no, Aptos is a good chain, man. Um, so, um, Gareth behind the, jet, behind the account here of Keystone has already told us that, you know, they use a bit more of a, um, a simplified uh, methodology uh, to security. Um, so, you know, they will, and they've already stated that they're not going to do any kind of recovery services for these, the exact reasons that we're talking about today. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, I think a, a more, more simplistic approach to like, uh, actual hardware wallets is the better way to go over. Um, and then maybe, um, having the more decentralized social recovery methods for on-chain methods. Um, yeah. Um, so, um, I think. Uh, we have got a couple of um, of uh, takes on this uh, just going around the Twitter sphere right now. Um, so, uh, one of which is um, the uh, the failure to understand uh, the objectives of hardware wallets, essentially like the ideals behind them. So, like if the whole point is to ensure that no one can actually get access to your um, to the stuff on your wallet, then um, why the hell would you actually do um, some kind of uh, recovery method in this in this fashion? Um, do you know why, um, like, uh, could anyone on the panel actually think of any, um, like, uh, positive, um, positive, reper positive repercussions of this? I mean, me, like I was saying earlier, like, I think the only positive thing about it is, is for people that are just, like, really not good with the computer. And they don't, they don't even want to, you know, they can't understand even how to 
to use blockchain, but they want to buy Bitcoin and or something and just have it on a hardware wallet. But they don't, you know, if they lost their seed phrase, that they'll be able to get it somehow. But I mean, I think most people that are in crypto that are, you know, in this space right now during the bear market, probably I would venture to say most of them are not interested in something like that unless it's on the blockchain. Like I personally want all my day. I, I basically want to just live in the blockchain. Like I want everything I have that's data wise, you know, in, on the blockchain. Like I don't want it on anything else. Maybe I'll have it on like a device or, you know, something where I can have that's encrypted or whatever as well. But I don't, I wouldn't want anyone knowing anything about what my, my information is, so to speak. No, I mean, that's a completely fair enough take. I'm, I'm kind of the same way. I'm a bit of a privacy maxi myself. I, I don't want to be like, I don't particularly want anyone to know uh, what's what well, it's not. I don't want anyone to know. It's just no one has a right to know what's going on on chain, uh, like with my identity, with who I am. Um, so, yeah, um, we've just uh, got another speaker up, uh, Ruben. He's been up a couple of times before. Hey, man, how you doing? Doing okay. I just wanted to say that the way Cosmos Haas talks about the blockchain is the same way Nicolas Cage talks about his adversary in the movie Face Off. Like, I, I wonder where, I wonder where, the blockchain. I yield my time. I like that. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> That's funny. Good stuff. Okay. That's hilarious. <laughs> Well, that was Ruben, everyone. Um, always, a, always a great guest. <laughs> uh, okay, well, in, uh, in, in that case, uh, if, uh, if Ruben doesn't... Uh, well, Ruben's impressed us with that take. So uh, what we'll do is we'll, uh, we'll probably nip on to uh, another, another topic, perhaps. Um, just, a, just a quickie, see if we can uh, get a bit more content in. Uh, because, obviously, like I say, we started a bit late. It'd be nice to get a bit more. Um, so I guess the, um, the most relevant thing I can find um, going around in the news right now is that the U.S. Chamber of Commerce um, has filed a brief in the uh, Coinbase versus SEC case. Um, so basically, they're actually like there's a couple of points that the, um, the Chamber of Commerce has made about this, um, but the main one for me is that they've actually said that it's unlawful. Um, they're basically just citing um, the, the Constitution, so you know it's uh, violating constitutional due process and fair notice rights. Um, so I don't know if anyone on the, uh, perhaps POS, you might be the best uh, position to answer this one really, I guess, or at least provide a take on it, uh, being, uh, being the American. Uh, but um, yeah, what, what, do you think, what do you think right now? Because the, this is actually a pretty major, um, like uh, a pretty major chamber of the US. Like it, it's, uh, this, this chamber of commerce actually has a, a lot of very highly, highly positioned businesses and important people in it. Um, so what do you think? Do you think I'm sorry. This is can, you, can you repeat the very beginning of the question? Yeah, sure, sure. I was just saying that the uh, so the U.S. Chamber of Commerce um, it's basically um, filed a brief. So you've got the Coinbase versus um, the Securities and Exchange Commission case going on right now. Um, so the U.S. Chamber of Commerce has filed a brief in this, just given basically their opinion in it, um, and they are essentially saying that the SEC is acting in an unconstitutional manner because they're ignoring constitutional due process and fair notice rights um, and acting in an unlawful manner. Um, so basically, I guess the question is, um, do you think the SEC is acting in a constitutional manner or if they're um, indeed being lawful with how they're um, trying to regulate by enforcement? Yeah, so like I'm not a big fan of like what they've been doing and how they're approaching it. And technically, if you like do dig in a little bit, they shouldn't even really have any sort of jurisdiction over digital assets anyhow. But yeah, the the whole regulation by enforcement is just bizarre. You know, I, I always give it the reference if you you have guidelines or like let, let's just use a sports reference. You know, the the rules are what they are, whatever they are. You participate in this game and then after the game you change the rules that would sway it for the other team to win the game and then you like go back and say, you know what, that other team actually wins because this role changed and this is why they won. You can't like you can't have rules and regulation or some sort of guidelines, so to speak, and the, and the other participant actually 
you know, does what you want them to do, but then you just don't like it and then you change it and then, and then attack them. You know, like I'll use the Coinbase reference, like Coinbase has to declare it, 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 it's a public company. So they had like the SEC had to sign off on it, and give them the green light and say, okay, you guys are a public company now. And then, you know, Coinbase and you know, they, they, they claimed and filed that they're going to do staking rewards, this and that. And then the SEC goes, okay. And then afterwards, like whenever they just d- decide to do it, you know, they'll just go, oh, you know what, actually that's illegal. And we're going to, we're going to make you pay fines for that. And that's just not a winning recipe for anything, whether that's like regulation or just like life in general, like any sort of context, like you can't just make rolls up, right? Like there's like a constitution, right? And it says, this is what it is. You can't just like one day decide you're going to change the constitution without a bunch of different people voting on it and agreeing on it. Because re- realistically, the SEC is supposed to work for the people. They're not just this like entity that's not paid by taxpayers, you know. And um, so, for, yeah. So, long story short, like the way they're behaving is just not moral and it's not it's not right. And I'm glad that people in Congress or, you know, chambers and just some politicians, not all of them, but some politicians are just having enough because like it realistically, it's just like a, um, it's a breach of power. It's just a, it's not the way that the country is supposed to be designed to do. You can't just change rules and constitutions and just guidelines, whenever you feel like it. And you know what? And also too, like I was just thinking of this, I know Coinbase and not even just Coinbase, but others, they, they have like reached out plenty of times and, and want, you know, they want like Gensler and the SEC to kind of sit down and give them straight answers, you know, and they still can't do it. It's like, oh, we're too busy for that. You know, no, no, you're not. You work for us. We don't work for you. And um, that's just kind of the approach. And, I, and I, I'm initially, if you'd asked me this question like a few months ago, am, am I, optimistic that this is going to get resolved in a timely fashion i probably would say no but like with you know we started this off about eu these other nations and and other places are are kind of seeing that like i I say this probably almost nearly every space but it's just it's a common phrase that's really applicable is another man's loss is another man's gain like these other countries and territories they're not they're not idiots they're not stupid and every i think everything's a competitive like spear, like life is competition. So if America is going to drag their feet on innovation and, and basically forcing this, you know, engineers and really bright minds to be lo- relocating, do you not think that they're going to be like, Hey, come here. And then they'll, they'll put guidelines and statutes in place that people at least know the rules of engagement. Like there's really right now it's sad. Like there's really no straight an- answers for anything. Like No one knows what to do. Even like, tax preparers and people that are preparing taxes like there's no guidelines on anything everything's just kind of like the wild wild west but the only difference between the wild wild west is like the wild wild west you could just do whatever you want and there's no rules but you know so that's kind of my thought process on it dude i absolutely love your take us um but you keep on saying wild wild west and i can't help thinking about the stupid movie i'm sorry <laughs> i just can't yeah. stop thinking of that stupid <laughs> rap at the beginning of the damn movie yeah. Did you ever play? Um, I'll let you get into the next topic. But did you ever play the Oregon Trail ever? Like the old? It's like a computer game, PC game. It's old. I'm talking about like, I don't know. It was really prevalent, like relevant back in like the ni- early '90s. It was like a PC game. R- repeat the name again. I don't think so. It's called the Oregon Trail. No man, no, I don't remember that. But it, it was kind of like a game, like you were like an explorer and you went out west. And you like explored and like you could do all kind of different things. But anyways, that that when I think of the Wild Wild West, I always think of that game as a kid. But anyways, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no doubt, man. Yeah, it's a it's a really interesting contrast, to be honest, between the the U.S. like how the U.S. is uh, is regulating by enforcement and throwing like all like um, driving innovation out of their own country, and how uh, the EU is just like you know okay here's your regulations there you go you can do it i mean some of them aren't great but you know what you're doing at least it's a it's a very very interesting contrast um uh, one that um we'll have to see how that works out on the global stage and like you know the uh socioeconomic stage of the world is uh, going to be interesting uh ruben you've uh, you've joined us up again mate did you do you have something else like uh, an interesting take on hoss you think so um I can, you know what? I can resonate. I can resonate with Gensler. I can resonate with the SEC. 
there's the spiciest take you've heard this week. Um, if I mean, their job is Mary Ed for a start. Um, and I think, like, you know, their role in part is to sort of balance the equities of as many parties as possible, and particularly um, diverse parties, right? Um, there's a lot of uh, concentrated interest in moving this forward for the crypto community. There's not as much concentrated interest for everybody else, at least from the standpoint of the government or those individuals who aren't necessarily expressing that, right? So, like, if you think about how many folks, uh, you know, how much of their experience has been, hey, I did some crypto stuff and my life was awesome immediately and consistently thereafter, right? Versus the amount of people who have done, quote, crypto stuff and they're like, oh, yeah, I bought a whatever coin and it exploded and now I'm sad, right? Like the, the, the stories and the narratives that they're hearing on like a federal level, it's probably mixed. Um, and they're probably getting a lot of stuff from, from all sides. I know there's a lot of people, you know, for as many maxis as there are, on, on crypto in general and decentralization in general. You can be damn sure that there's people who are like, oh, don't touch that stuff. It's for people who are trading shenanigans on the underwebs, right? Um, and so, like, to take a defensive position of um, litigation versus legislation that is, like, bottom-up, sort of responsive, reactive, as opposed to, you know, uh, progressive slash um, prescriptive from the top down, um, I can respect the, I can respect what feels like them trying to preserve optionality to be able to deal with things that they don't fully necessarily understand and probably can't, pre well, certainly cannot predict. Um, what we choose to do with that, with that sort of gap in awareness and access by extension is, is up to us. Um, I can certainly see well, you know, whilst there are there is like sufficient uncertainty as a result of a lack of um, clarity, you know, preventing people from getting in who will only get in when things are you know compliant and you know totally legit. Quote, um, you know, it, look if it grows organically in the meantime, I think it's fine, right? Like, and and to the extent that there's a lot of the stuff that they might choose to come out with is unenforceable in the first place. Um, you know, materially, whether that's because the counterparties in a particular transaction across multiple jurisdictions beyond the enforcement powers of any particular nation state, or whether, um, you know, the actor's geolocation is hard to define in the first place, right? Because, if, if, I mean, there's like, there's like a cascade of things that you need to have. You need to be able to define the infringement, which is where we're lacking here. You need to be observe the infringement, which is uh, challenging in a decentralized environment. You need to attribute it to an infringing party. And then you, that, and then after that, you can start getting into like jurisdictional law. And so there's a lot of uncertainty uh, for everybody, but but and by extension, there's a lot of uncertainty for them, right? It's not like, um, you know, it's not like meat space where um, you know you can sort of ping the the IP address and you know back down to a device ID and figure out this is definitely the person, this is definitely what their intention was, this is definitely the the laws for this particular jurisdiction. It's um it's expanding a lot further than that. Um, and so I can see why they would be reticent to sort of, to push. Um, and that sort of, and it also retains the threat of them coming down. Um, like the ambiguity is a position of strength for them because if somebody wants to do something, well, maybe the government might beat us up about it. Well, good. Let them, let the crypto shenanigans folks think that, right? Cause maybe we will. Right. So I, I, I can, I, Look, uh, to me, I think it's a net win. Um, one, it's because we, we get to define the story as builders and as creators and architects. Um, I think that, you know, the scope of the language that you're using right now is, bro is, is particularly broad as it applies to the Howey test. For those unfamiliar, the Howey test is a legal test which defines whether or not something is a security. And the criteria are three things. Number one, if a contract exists in a common enterprise, where there's a reasonable expect expectation of an increase in value as a result of the work of, of third parties, that's four criteria, um, that is a security must be registered with the SEC. Um, now, all four of those things are our preferred interpretation. Mm, well, <laughs> it depends, but like the, the language is pretty broad on all four of those categories, right? If a contract exists, are we talking about a smart contract, right? As a common enterprise, everybody in a blockchain, um, is there a reasonable expectation of like what is a reasonable expectation, right? Like it's it's pretty open, and so there. I think 
they're reserving that breadth because they don't know what they're going to have to deal with. And if I were them, I might do the same thing, honestly. Um, that doesn't mean that uh, we wouldn't stand to benefit from greater clarity. Um, but I do think that the silver lining is that we get to define the story, right? The best way to predict the future is to build it. So there's, there's my hot take. Man, it's a, it's a good take, Ruben. It really is. And I appreciate you arguing the other side, to be honest. It's always good. Um, so I guess you're kind of just saying that they're taking the ignorance is bliss route. <laughs> and uh, like uh, as compared to uh, trying to um, come up with a legislation, come up with something, come up with an answer for everything. They're just uh, biding their time and trying to trying to muddy their way through it. Um, it's, it's a difficult thing to square, I guess, because... I get you've got them again. You've you've got the EU trying to basically uh, regulate everything, and they could, like I say, coming up with an answer for everything. Um, but they are inviting uh, innovation that way by allowing um, allowing crypto companies and crypto um, like interested companies to have a set of rules to go by. Whereas you know, I guess it really it's an it's a question of. Uh, does America believe blockchain has a future? Um, and uh, I'm not sure what the answer to that question is, to be honest. I think America as a whole does. I'm just not sure about some of the entities that are involved in the governance of it. Whereas the EU, by providing this regulatory clarity, clearly thinks that crypto has a future. Um, so it's just a, it's just an interesting thing, I guess. Uh, we'll have to see if they uh, answer that question in the affirmative or not. Yeah, it's, it's a question of jurisdictional bleed. Um, a, a good example of this is, um, is anybody familiar with ITAR regulations, I-T-A-R? It's a sort of um, vestige of the Cold War, um, TLDR. If anybody is uh, making anything that goes into space and they do so on American soil, they have so many laws that prevent them from telling anybody else about it. Uh, like something really is super simple, right? So like if you have a satellite, and you have a small piece of copper wire that hangs off the bottom, well, bottom is relative, Earth side from the satellite, and, it, and, and you shoot electrons down it to sort of ping it very slowly, right? It's literally just a piece of copper wire, you're shooting down some electrical signal, and it provides like the tiniest nudge, which in a zero, gra well, relative zero, gra low gravity environment is enough to maintain the orbit of a, of a satellite. Literally, here's a piece of copper wire, it's at the bottom of the thing, and we're just pinging it every now and then. You, like, you could build it in a weekend. You, you could build it in an hour at the local hardware store. That was, like, highly classified technology, right? Because, you know, the Russians, oh no, what's going to happen? Everyone's got nukes. Ah! So, so NASA, right, which is the U.S. government department, has a lot of trouble with U.S. military, right, particularly the Air Force, which is a much larger budget, much stronger um, lobbyists, and so on. NASA has a hard time get, making any traction to do a lot of stuff because of these RTAR regulations, which basically they have to go ask the Air Force if what they want to do is allowed before they can do anything interesting. Um, and as a side effect of that, we saw um, a really good example is uh, remember Richard Branson with Virgin Galactic? Uh, he had, uh, yeah, it's like $200,000 to. Uh, 125,000 American um, to get seven minutes in space on a suborbital flight. Pretty cool, right? Um, but he wanted to have customers from all over the world, and there are ITAR restrictions preventing somebody who is in certain countries from participating in any U.S. flight-based uh, process. And so the island of Curacao, um, we're like, hey, we need stuff. Um, we need money. Is so y'all y'all need a big concrete pad close to the equator where it's spinning fast enough that you have to use less force to get off the ground? Uh, and uh, Branson was like, yeah, sure. So if somebody from Iran, for example, purchase a ticket on Virgin Galactic, they'll be launching not from America, right, where all of the operations are, but from a concrete pad in Curacao because of these jurisdictional issues, right? So yes, absolutely. Um, you know, the more restrictive the environment or the more uncertain, relative uncertain environment that you have jurisdictionally, it tends to sort of externalize uh, innovation. Um, it also tend, it, it can also externalize um, 
I mean, it's a, it's a double. It really is a double-edged sword. So they're. The, the trade that they're making right now is, I guess, a lot of the cool stuff will be offshore, um, you know. And, and I think the sort of the counter to that is that Coinbase is U.S. based, uh, and I think that was a very deliberate attempt to sort of do what's called the hug of death, where you hug your you hug your potential adversary so tightly that it becomes painful, trading wise, to to part ways. Right? You, you don't want to start a war if <laughs> with your biggest customer, right? Um, so it's. Uh, It'll be interesting to see how things play out, but at the cycles and the speed that those cats are moving, um, I think the the upside is that again you know, it, it doesn't affect a lot of what we're doing on the ground level. Certainly, look at the prim primitives level, um, and I think you know as um, w whether the innovation sort of um, is sort of I want to say extrajudicial from the standpoint of going to another country and starting in another country from a domicile standpoint. Or whether it is extrajudicial from the standpoint of just going under the technology, right? So, like privacy coins or other sort of privacy tech, end to end encryption, Tor browsers, so on and so forth. Um, the, I think the US is at least aware that the harder they come down on something, the faster people are going to respond to that behavior and take it underground or offshore, you know, if, it, if, it, if they deem it non favorable. So, it's. Um, so I guess that you know time will tell, but it it does give us a window to build some some cool stuff. Absolutely, man, and uh, that's that's our goal at least. Got to kill, got to build some really cool stuff. <laughs> um, in fact, um, we just uh, we just been, I think it was a, about a week or two ago uh, where we released our um, like our vision of a decentralized uh, innovation funding model. Um, we call it the Academy of Sciences. It's uh, it's all decentralized. It's based on uh, on the same kind of principles as our main merit as our main uh, governance system. So it's all meritocratic. Uh, it's all citizen led. Um, so you know, um, citizens can essentially vote on uh, uh, can vote through projects that they really want to see on the chain, and then um, those projects that uh, get voted through, um, part of their you know the value that they produce. Is, it goes back to the citizens through their universal basic income, uh, so it's like it's like this uh, feedback loop of innovation and value. Um, like, like we we really think that innovation should be uh, I don't know it should be uh, in, in, it should be accessible, inclusive. It should be um, it, it shouldn't really be stymied by any other stuff. Um, it's a it's a it's a damn shame when people are trying to regulate it away. Uh, but you're right. Like it, it doesn't really affect us on the ground level. You're right. It's uh, you know, right now it's kind of a good situation to be a builder. We're at the very like uh, we're in a bad way financially in the financial markets. We're in a, a um, an uncertain regulatory space. It's uh, it's kind of a good time to build. Um, so yeah, no, we're we're enjoying it for sure. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, guys. Um, what I'm just going to say right now, uh, if we could just get um, everyone in the space right now to jump down into the comments, we would love to get a few more likes, a few more retweets on this space. It would, we would really appreciate it. Just get some more uh, knowledge and the recording out to more people. Uh, we currently got um, Cosmos Hoss, my co-host. We've got Ruben up here as a speaker, who's really been entertaining and uh, always has good takes on things. Uh, we've got Keystone Wallet. Um, who is a fantastic uh, hardware wallet manufacturer and designer? Um, it, their wallet looks absolutely amazing. I can't, um, I can't say I've, I've, I've used one. It just looks fantastic. We're going to have to have a little chat with you guys, Keystone. I'd love to have a chat with you about some of the stuff that Galactica is doing. And we have our technical lead, A Star Gala Frederick, um, who is absolutely always. Uh, your takes are so valuable, mate. Um, so if you would like to come up and join us uh, in the last uh, maybe 10 minutes of this space, if you'd like to speak on any of the topics we've spoken about today, you're more than welcome. Just uh, go down to the heart icon and uh, click on request to speak, the big hand on the right hand side. Uh, we'll pull you up and we can just have a little chat just uh, just to wind down a bit. Uh, we've been talking about uh, SEC uh, regulation by enforcement, which has been the current segment. Previous to this, uh, we were talking about um, Ledger Recover and the issue over there with hardware wallets um, and uh, Ledger's um, um, decision to build in a recovery system uh, that involves centralized entities and releasing uh, releasing uh, seed phrases, albeit in encrypted forms. Um, so we've got some really interesting topics we've gone over. Uh, if you'd like to put anything in, 
we'd be really appreciating your uh, your input. Um, so for until we unless we uh, get any speakers, I'd just like to ask um, Keystone, uh, perhaps if you would like to uh, just describe your product to us uh, and uh, what you're doing on the hardware wallet side, uh, that would be a really interesting thing to hear for everyone here, I think. Keystone, do we still have you, uh, Gareth? <laughs> okay i think uh, we may have lost lost keystone okay that's cool uh in that case guys uh if we don't have anyone who uh wishes to uh to have a little chat and then um, because we started the space late anyway we're we're running a bit late anyway um so we'll just uh wind down the stream right now um i'd like to I'd just like to say this has been a really good space, despite the fact that we started a bit late. Uh, we've had some really good takes and insights from our speakers. Uh, we're really thankful to all of you guys for doing that. Um, I'd like to just uh, say um, thank you to the audience, um, the AMA speakers especially, of course. Um, if you could check the pinned tweet, that would be really good. Uh, that's basically an introduction video into what um, Galactica is trying to do. Um, it's uh, only eight minutes long, but it describes kind of most of the basics of what we're doing. Um, so just check it out. Give it a like if you want to, uh, if you if you do like it. Um, check out the website. Uh, you can go for sign up for our newsletter there and just get the latest. Uh, people who sign up for the newsletter will, of course, get the absolute um, bleeding edge of what we're doing. So if there's any like dev nets, test nets, all that stuff coming up, then they will be in the newsletter. Um, Make sure you check out our guest socials. Uh, so check out Keystone Wallet. I realize that they've uh, disappeared at the moment, uh, but they are worth checking out. So just check out their socials. Always, always give Ruben a like. Give Cosmos also a like because he's my co-host and he's, he's my bro. Um, so um, yeah, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. And, uh, and we look forward to seeing you on the next episode of Into the Cypher State. Thank you very much for your time, everyone, and see you soon.